So um, our next speaker, Matt Palmer, is going to tell us about ops-friendly system development. Please make him welcome. No, we need we need the microphone, so save questions to the end. What's that one there? Oh, look at that. There we go. It wasn't even turned on. Yeah. That was why. Righto then. So, um, yes, I assume that everyone here is a developer or is thinking about being a developer or is at least developer curious. Um, I myself am, am more of a sysadmin. I do write software, but most of the time my job is to keep the software that other people write up and running. Um, so this is a very selfish talk. I say, say me and I a lot, because really at the end of the day, this is, about, this is a talk that helps my life become a lot easier. But amongst the people in the audience here, um, who, who here is writing server-oriented software? Services, you know, it takes a request and puts a response in. So that's where I live as well. Services is my life. Um, so what I talk about today is the examples and ideas that tend to be focused in that area. But hopefully, even if you don't do service-oriented service development, you'll still get something out of it because the ideas do map fairly well. So of the people who are here and who write service software, how many of you write any software for which you have sole operational responsibility? You're the only person who's ever going to touch that software and, and run it. A few people, yep, I've got some of those, some stuff, some personal projects and so forth. Um, what about the people who, who write software probably with the rest of a team, but then also share that operational responsibility with a team as well? Yep, not as many as I was expecting, actually. This is the DevOps concept, really. Um, you know, it's, it's they who write the software, run the software, and, and keep it going and, and so forth. And then finally, this, the, the third group is, well, how about at some point when you're writing the software, you then hand it off to somebody else and you no longer have direct operational responsibility. Yeah? There's, yeah not that many of you left these days. Um, how many of you write open source server software, by the way, and who didn't stick their hand up before? Yeah, you're in this group as well, by the way. Um, if you write open source software that other people are supposed to run, then somebody else is operating that software and you're, you're feeding bug reports back to you. Now, the concepts that I'm talking about in, in, in my talk today are about making whoever, whether that be you, you and the rest of a team, or some other poor sod entirely, making their lives easier. It's about helping them to find the source of a problem, to, lo to localise down a problem from a complex system, and then also to, uh, to identify exactly what the problem is and either fix it, if it's something they can fix, or at least feed useful information back um, to the development team if, if they're separate people. So, and it's all about, yeah, it's all about problem solving, okay? Um, I can't really go into a lot about problem solving, the, the techniques and so forth you go into it today, but I kind of, it's a theme that sort of touches throughout the talk, um, because without a rational problem solving um, capability, then you're really just stabbing. You're just randomly guessing as to what might be wrong. And uh, let me tell you, I've watched some people try and do that over the years, and it doesn't end well. <laughs> it, uh, it gets a bit ugly. So let's talk about a, a relatively simple and straightforward um, system that you might have that's a web-oriented type system. So you've got your load balancers up the top there um, that are just taking in requests. Obviously, it must be some sort of layer 7 balancer because it's able to send stuff to your web server or your forum software, an SSO system, a billing system because everyone loves to get paid sooner or later. Um, and down here, you've got a little... It looks like someone might have got a little bit of the microservices... Um, bug at some point and they've extracted out some, some microservice information, it's a separate system. And again, all these systems have databases associated with them. You know, your billing system's got to have a database because you want to remember who paid you. Your web server, it's a CMS of some sort. Your forum's got two databases because, you know, different developers like different databases over time, so someone decided to stick something else in there. And your user system, you know, users, logins, passwords, things like that. Now, whether you're building a monolith or whether you're building a microservices architecture, the concepts in this talk, they align very well because every system is composed of components, of modules that, that sit together. In a microservices type system, it's very obvious where the boundaries between those modules are. Uh, but in a, in, a, in a monolithic type system, you've still got those modules. You've still got some piece of code is doing this and there's a relatively well-defined interface to another chunk of code. I'll talk about components. Um, I may occasionally talk, you know, slip systems in there, but I'm talking about any blob of code that is fairly well self-contained, has a fairly good interface 
to other parts of the system. So don't think that this is some sort of microservices only thing and you can get away without it if you're uh, running a big old fat JVM monolith. Because now every system from the outside looks like this, okay? Something goes in, things happen, whatever those things might be, and then you get something come out the other end. Uh, this doesn't just apply to software. This is every system in the world. Think of an oil refinery. Massive big system. Crude oil goes in, things happen, and petrol and diesel and kerosene and tar and everything come out the other end. Um, now, in an oil refinery, they know what's going on inside the system by means of gauges. There's not someone who actually sits there and watches the petrol flow out of the system and, and everything, the cracking towers and all the rest of it happen. And similar kinds of things, ha we have to do similar kinds of things in our system if we want to be able to see where, it, where everything's happening and how it's happening. And so if we take our system from earlier and we attack some gauges to all of it, luckily we don't have to plumb in um, you know, physical bits and pieces and route them back to some control center somewhere, we can just add in some software. So I'm not a particularly smart person myself, I don't come up with good ideas, but I'm really happy to steal other people's, and I think the best uh, description of how to instrument a system simply and straightforwardly is this article here from the Honeycomb team. Um, they've got a whole series of really interesting articles, I highly recommend all of them, um, but what I'm talking about here today for instrumentation is basically this, uh, this concept whittled down a little bit and, and adapted um, to my particular circumstances. So it's all about simplicity, this article. It's not about building a whole oil refinery with every possible instrument everywhere. It's about getting a straightforward dashboard that you can apply to any system. Anyone can sit down in a car if they've driven pretty much any car before and understand the basics of what that's telling you. Okay, how fast the engine's going? Is the engine running at all? How fast are you going? Is the engine overheating? How much fuel have you got? Simple, straightforward things. And my theory is that if all systems had instrumentation similar to what I'm describing today, it would be very straightforward for anyone to sit down at a new system and go, ah, this is a Unix system, I know this. <laughs> yeah, I watched Jurassic Park with the kids the other week, it doesn't age well, I'm sorry. Now, any component in a system always has some sort of input, okay? Whether it's HTTP request uh, or some other socket IO, a method call in a, you know, in, a, in a monolithic type system, or a timer. Um, a lot of people forget about timers. They're always just you know, making stuff happen, but there's still a stimulus that goes into the component of your system. And then the component does some sort of processing, and usually, or most of the time, but not always, they call out to other systems, other modules, other components, databases, other microservices, other modules within the system, whatever. And the best way to find out whether or not your component is operating correctly and whether or not you can blame it or you have to blame something else is to look at those inputs and outputs. So let's have a look at what, what you can do to measure things coming into a particular component. So when you're instrumenting incoming requests, whatever they may be, start off by counting how many of requests you've received total. And if you can, break it down by what sort of requester you have. So if, you, if you're in a, a, co, you know, a, a simple code-based system, a monolith, where, where you've just got function calls coming in, that's great. Try and count which other module it is that's making the request. If you've got a microservices environment uh, where you know that you've only got certain other of your internal microservices hitting you, count up by user agent or token or whatever, something to give you a breakdown. If you're putting this on the internet, I wouldn't bother doing it by like IP address or, or user agent or something, because you just end up with billions of counters that don't really tell you anything useful. But where you can, break it down by the requester, and we'll see why in a minute. Also, count back how many responses you've actually sent back in response to those requests. And break it down by whether or not that was successful or whether some sort of error occurred. And again, break down those errors one by one. So in a HTTP type system, count how many times you sent back a 200, a 404, a 403, a 429, a 500, a 502, et cetera, et cetera. For every single response code you can send back, have a counter for it. Because that way you can more easily identify exactly what sort of error you're sending back and not just hmm, something bad happened. Also measure how long it took. Uh, if your instrumentation system can do some sort of histogram type thing, um, a lot of them can these days, they're fantastic. But even if you can't, just keep a, a running total of how long each request took, because then that plus how many responses you've got can give you a, an arithmetic mean, which is far better than nothing. And again, break that down by successes 
and errors so that you can measure how long your successful requests are taking versus your errors and so forth. And finally, it's good to have a, some sort of a, an indication of exactly how many requests you're handling right now, because that's just nice and easy to graph. Um, and also, you can do some sanity checking later. But of course, what does all that mean? Once we've got this, this data, that's one thing. But unless you know how to interpret it, it's not very valuable. You might as well just be throwing it to dev null. Now, for request received, if you're graphing this over time and you see a sudden thump drop in request rate, what does that mean? Well, the proximate thing is upstream stops sending us questions. Now, that may be that, you did, that there is some sort of error just at your, your boundary, or, or you sent back a 429, you know, too many requests come back later. But it's likely that it could be that there's an comp upstream component that has suddenly fallen over. So if, and, and if you're breaking down your request rate by requester, if you can do that, then you can identify which upstream it is that's, that's suddenly causing problems. So in, a, in the first place, you're probably going to start looking upstream. You're going to go look and have, have a look at those problems up there. And if there's a sudden increase in request rate, well, obviously, something is hammering you. And again, if you've got it broken down by requester, you can go and have a look at that, at that upstream and go, well, what's going on here? But at the very, even if you can't break it down, you just go, OK, I'm having a lot more requests now. So if you're also seeing an increase in response time, for instance, you can go, OK, well, it's because I'm getting hammered. And so therefore, I can go and, and you know, rummage around and see what it is that's, that's causing me problems, as opposed to thinking, oh, geez, it's because my database is going slow? I don't know. Well, now you do. For the responses that are going back, uh, you know, if you've got an increase in the error rate, well, you're sending back errors. Now, it might not be your fault. If you're, hitting a, if you're a web service and you're hitting a database and that database has gone down, you're going to start sending back 500s or some sort of you know, error code back. So this by itself doesn't tell you that you're at fault, but it does tell you that it's not really upstream's fault. So you can start looking downstream of now. You can, you, you're divvying up by trying to identify exactly where it is a problem is. You're just divvying up the system. You're going, look here. Is it there or there? Right, it's it. It's a binary search. We've done these. We know these. This is, this is what this is all about. It's building basically a binary search for problems in your systems. And if you get an increase in the time taken, well, something's slowed down again, or it's something downstream of you. So you can start looking in those areas. And your in-progress counter, uh, or your gauge, is useful. Um, if you see an increase in in-progress requests, things that are going right at the moment, well, that's weird. It doesn't necessarily indicate a problem per se, but it's worth looking into. Are you taking longer to process each request? Or are you just getting more requests? What's going on there? And then finally, you can do a sanity check between um, how many in-progress requests you have on your gauge versus how many re requests you've got versus, and subtracting how many responses you've sent. Um, and that can give you a, a sanity check. And if that doesn't match up, then you've got a problem with your instrumentation. Um, I've hit this personally. My instrumentation library was telling me that I had minus 20 requests in progress. No, that wasn't right. <laughs> so yeah, I rummaged around. It turned out there was a missing lock. I had a race condition. Thank you very much, Prometheus. Now, once you've instrumented the, in the input side, what about your outputs? All those requests you make. Now, not every system has other systems that it, other components that it calls to, uh, but a lot of them do, and it's worth instrumenting those, and this is how we do it. Now, for each downstream component, so if you have a database and two other microservices, you want three sets of, of metrics. And you want to count how many requests we've sent to that back end. We want to count how many responses we've received back and break it down by what sort of um, success or error we got. And don't just think about it in terms of uh, layer 7 errors either. If you're doing a HTTP uh, system, for instance, don't just record 200, 404, 500, whatever. Also record connection timed out, connection refused, um, connection broken midstream. Have all of those, because that way you, can, you get, a, get a better idea of exactly what sort of errors you're seeing when you start seeing them. Not if, when you start seeing errors. This is the real world. Um, again, measure time taken to get a response. Uh, histograms, averages, etc. Break that down by success error again, and then finally, how many you've got right now. This might look familiar because it's pretty much exactly the same as, as what we had on the other side. Um, and it turns out that it's, it's quite straightforward to build a little library that does exactly this and attach it everywhere, all of your inputs and all of your outputs to every component, and suddenly you've got statistics everywhere. It's fantastic. So again, what does this mean? Well, for requests sent, 
Um, if you get a sudden drop in your incoming to outgoing ratio this time, do a comparison between the requests that are coming into your service and the requests that you're sending back out again. Um, and if that changes, then there's something that's changed in the, in the way the code is behaving. Now, maybe you've deployed a new version, you're suddenly making more database queries than you were before, um, but it could be that there's some sort of bug, some sort of loop that's going on and you know, sending out 20 DB requests for every, for every request you get now, rather than just one. Uh, if the ratio goes the other way, then presumably something upstream is sending you a different sort of request in such a way that you're no longer hitting your downstream. That's a bit weird, isn't it? It's worth looking at your code paths and seeing if maybe you're taking some sort of shortcut or you're sending errors back but something else isn't picking it up. You're kind of double checking here. Um, for responses received, if you get an increase in error rate coming back from whatever it is that you're talking to, then the problem is definitely down there. Okay, you, you, you can't be blamed, normally, for errors that are coming from, down from something else. Now, there are certain errors, of course. Um, you know, if, your, if your database sends back um, an error that says, I don't understand this query, well, you've got a syntax error in your query. Um, if a downstream microservice is sending you back a 400, that normally means you sent me a bad request. Please try that again and do it differently this time. But you can normally identify that the problem is coming from downstream and then start hunting into those downstream systems and figure out where the problem is down there. And if it's an increase in time taken, well then, you've definitely got a problem downstream. And if you're hunting down a performance problem and it looks like the problem's here, but then you've got a downstream that's, telling you that's also slowed down, well, don't bother looking here anymore. Go, go hunt down that way. Go down there. The problem's over there somewhere. For in progress, Again, increased progress request means that you're probably slowing down or something downstream is slowing down or you've got more requests coming in that you're then trying to pass on to somewhere else. Um, and again, we, you can compare this against your, your requests and so forth and come up with the fact that your instrumentation has got another race condition. So all of this stuff is fantastic for telling you where a problem is in a larger system, identifying the component. But unless you're incredibly lucky, it's not going to tell you why the problem is occurring exactly. Okay, it'll only, it'll only give you down to a smallish, hopefully smallish, blob of code. If you want to know exactly why something went wrong, you're going to need yourself some logs. Lots and lots of logs. I love logs. Um, my boss is always complaining that I'm a digital hoarder. Um, I'm always trying to keep more logs than he wants me to keep. He keeps saying, just go, come on. I'm like, no, I might need them later. I'm, I, I could be on you know, the show Digital Hoarders if there was one. Um, so the question is, if logs are so wonderful, why am I bothering with your instrumentation? Well, that's because there's just way too many logs to be keeping. My, my boss is right. There are way more logs than we need um, than, than we can reasonably store. In fact, at the moment, our, our infrastructure costs for logging and, and instrumentation run between about 10 to 20% of our total infrastructure cost. And we're not collecting nearly enough data to be able to identify with any reasonable certainty which component of a system is, is causing us problems if we needed to, which is exactly what the instrumentation system is doing for in a much more lightweight fashion. So I don't think there's many organisations out there that are going to say, oh, yeah, I can spend 80% of my infrastructure budget on logging and still be able to service all my customers. It's just not, not feasible. So you need to have this sort of two-pronged approach. Instrumentation is very lightweight and you get a lot of counters for not much money, but it's only going to get you so far. Once you, you identify a particular component, then you need to switch to your logs. And in the very, very rare case, you might not be running at scale, or you do have you know, that one in a zillion company that has too much money and can spend 80% of their money on uh, just collecting logs, you've still got to find the damn problem in logs. Now, I love tracing through logs. I you know, sit there in Kibana and bang away at things. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it still takes time to rummage through all the, that log data and come up with, with the answer. So, um, how many of you out there can recite off the top of your head the eight syslog priorities? Yeah, no, I don't know, I've got a few of them, but yeah. And there are eight of them, I went and counted them, and I think the reason is because they had three bits in the, the, the big number in the syslog protocol, and so they went, well, we've got three bits, eight priorities, let's make up eight to fill it up. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, there's really only three you care about. Um, the first off is, oops, error. Something big, nasty has happened and we, need to, we want to know about it. Keep all of those. Don't ever throw errors away. Um, they're fantastic for at least knowing what sort of errors you've got. Um, and error data is a, is a gold mine. 
Then you've got informational type stuff. Um, you know, there's various things that go in here. But typically, you can throw some of them out if you really need to. Um, statistical uh, you know, uh, selection, algorithms, and so forth. And then finally, the, the, the debug logging, or you know, here's a story that I, that I told about what I did on my holidays. And it's just it's this, 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 this. So, so the three log priorities, what do you do with them? For logging errors, please give me a full stack trace. If you don't give me a full stack trace, I'm going to be a very, very sad panda. And you don't want a sad panda. If you're going to, to add more information, augment it over time, add information, never replace it. Um, this goes to stack traces as well. Um, Puppet shits me to tears because it tends to eat exceptions. And so it'll, you'll get an exception out. It'll be Puppet something or other error. And the stack trace will only go to where the Puppet exception was raised. So there's this big thing of code up here that's, that's got some error in it somewhere, and I don't know where it is because he didn't give me the full stack trace. So if you're going to put some more info in there, add to it. Add more fields or add to the string or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, capture all the relevant variables in environment and everything. If your language allows it, capture all the local variables in the frame where it occurred. Most languages don't have this. So at least give me sort of the top level information. Where you're catching and logging that exception, at least give me all the info that you know about that. You know, in a HTTP system, all of your HTTP inputs. Um, we're hopefully, we're past dumping out big, long blobs of text these days. Structure your info. Use JSON uh, is usually the one that everyone uses these days. And, and use it to its advantage. So for your stack trace, stack trace, colon, array, all of your stack frames, um, all of your variables, variables, colon, you know, key value, key value, key value, key value. It makes it much easier to filter and sort and analyze and all sorts of things. Um, here's a quick example of something. This pulled out of uh, Logster, out of my day jobs uh, system discourse. Um, you've got your host name, processor, the application version, all useful information. And then all that other stuff there is per request information. Every single request gets different uh, values to go in there. That's the sort of the bare minimum um, that you want to be putting out there if you're going to be logging errors. Now, for informational logging, uh, that's some startup messages. You're probably going to log them once. Um, basic per request information, you know, access log type data. Um, and if you need to, yeah, use sampling. Um, there's another Honeycomb blog post about sampling. It's fantastic, well worth reading. For debug logging, um, who out there wants to admit to being a printf debugger? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, represent my peeps. Um, all of you have a really big head start in debug logging because debug logging is basically printf debugging at web scale. So when you've spent all of your time getting really embarrassed putting all the printfs and then quickly deleting them before you commit, no, stand proud. Replace them with log.debug and commit the damn things. <laughs> They're fantastic. It's great, you know. So, um, Tag them with the module and method with your structured data so that I can filter down which module of code, what method I'm, I'm interested in. If you can, grid a unique ID for every request that comes in and tag all of the log messages with that. So I, once I identify a particular request that's an issue, I can look at all the log data. And again, late bind the log data uh, if you can, because debug logging can be a real performance problem. So if you, you can do, spend a lot of time, CPU time, constructing this data structure before you know whether or not you're going to log it, you could be spending a lot of CPU time for stuff that never happens. And pretty quickly, the rest of the developers on your team will go, no, we can't afford the CPU cost of this debug logging. And they're right. You can't. So instead, don't do anything with the data as little as possible until you know you're going to log it. You know, if logging, debugging, debug logging enabled, do it. And allow selective activation if you can. Feature flags are fantastic if you've got them. Otherwise, if you've got a little hidden special URL I can pass some data to, that would be awesome. And finally, signals. Anything that I write that you find out there has probably got uh, hooks for user one and user two um, so that I can raise and lower the, the logging level in the system. So in summary, if you want me to be able to solve problems, I need to be able to see what's going on in there. If you instrument it, I can isolate down the module of the system that we care about. Log all your errors and capture them all the time and allow me to turn on and off debug logging without having to restart or, God forbid, rebuild the software. Allow me to turn it on just straight away and away we go. And if you can do all, any or more of those things, everyone, you, me, that poor uh, junior sysadmin out there will be very, very happy with you. <laughs> Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay.